Kodai Senga is trying to recruit top free agent Yoshinobu Yamamoto to the New York Mets. Will his pitch pay off? We'll discuss that on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Before we discuss Yamamoto and Kodai Senga's push for the Mets to sign him. I want to address what's going on in the baseball world with the games that are actually being played. The Texas Rangers have advanced to the World Series, beating the Houston Astros, maybe the most hated team in baseball nowadays. They knock out the defending champs. Max Scherzer started game seven, and they had a quick hook getting him out in the third inning. Uh, it doesn't quite look like Max Scherzer uh, of old. And Maybe that's why the Mets were right to trade him. But now he's got a shot to win a World Series, and he's going to be starting some of those games. So we'll see how that ultimately you know, plays out. And always in the back of these celebrations, you see Jacob DeGrom's face, which is just weird as a Mets fan. But, hey, I would love it if DeGrom got a ring. Obviously, you know he would prefer to be pitching to get that ring. But, hey, you know he, he seems to be enjoying himself, and that really does bring me joy as a, a guy that rooted for Jacob DeGrom for a long time. And still – Roots for Jacob DeGrom. Let's get to the story at hand, which was published in The Athletic today, written by Will Salmon, that was exploring the Mets and their pursuit of Yoshinobu Yamamoto and how Kodai Senga could help the cause and also how the factors are lining up for Yamamoto to be a real fit for the Mets. The first big factor, just like Senga last year, Yamamoto reportedly wants to pitch in a big market. So that's one big check mark for the New York Mets. Also, he is open to playing with another Japanese player. There's always been that you know, rumor out there, and Ken Rosenthal did a story about about the hierarchy uh, of players and how they prefer to be the only Japanese player on a team. But according to this article, that's not believed to be the case for Yamamoto. He has an open mind about the possibility of playing alongside another Japanese player and says right in the article, league sources said that Yamamoto's experience playing in the World Baseball Classic with other stars from Japan helped influence him in that regard. Now, at the end of the season, this is the really juicy detail from uh, this article. It says Kodai Senga vocalized wanting Yamamoto to Mets management. He also made that desire known in Japan, which is important and rare, they say. They make it very clear, Senga wants to win. And so he is the one going into the Mets front office and saying, this is a guy we should be targeting. He's you know, a, a top starting pitcher. It's an absolute dog of a competitor. Get him in here and echoing that on the other side of it, which is where he really brings great value because when it eventually gets to the point where there is a meeting, the Mets could have Kodai Senga in the room. The Mets could have Kodai Senga speaking to Yamamoto one-on-one -on -one, talking about how the Mets helped him get acclimated. And one of the things that's said in this article is that Yamamoto uh, says people familiar with Yamamoto's thinking suggest he wants to go where he believes he can be most successful and adjust the fastest. And Kodai Senga said, look, at the season I just put up, the Mets helped me get there. And the Mets are a, a great place to play when things are going well, which didn't happen a lot this year, but he can still hype up the fan interaction and, and, and all, all the positives. And he is going to give that full court press that might just hit the scale when the offers might be the same. You know, a lot of other teams, they're going to present their pitch. They're going to say why they have a better chance of winning than the Mets or the other teams that are in the running and why that is the place where he can go and be an ace and, and get all the personal accolades and all the team accolades he wants. But again, having Senga in your corner in this regard, and not only in your corner, having him vocal in your corner, because it's one thing for Kodai Senga to just – be okay with it. You know, they talked to him. Yeah. Would love Yamamoto to come on board, but 
That's just them coming to Senga and asking before they make the pursuit. And he's just, you know, off to the side, not really being active in those discussions. It's a complete other thing for him to not only be, you know, making that point clear to the Mets, but also, again, he made that desire known in Japan to, to have that indication. And also, he has the same agent. <laughs> so that's a, another thing, too. These guys, both represented by the same, well, maybe not the same agent, the same agency, the article says, Wasserman. Obviously, if they have the same agency, there's going to be a pretty open line of communication. So the Mets are going to get in the room with Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Steve Cohen if this really is their top priority this offseason to sign him. And again, as much as you can look at the pie in the sky of Shohei Otani, to me, if you sign Yamamoto and you trade for Juan Soto and extend him and get two players instead of just the one, I feel a lot better knowing that for the next, let's say, eight years, you're going to get quality pitching from Yamamoto because that's all he's focused on doing. And so I feel so much better about his chance to stay healthy and to stay effective doing that one thing. Then I feel about Otani doing it. And then the same thing goes on the other side. You know, maybe I, I feel like Otani's a better hitter than Soto, but I also don't think that he's ever going to get hurt pitching because Soto is never going to pitch. And so for less money, Again, like that combination to me, that's the absolute dream. The absolute dream to me is not Shohei Otani on the Mets. As much as if it happens, hey, I'll be on board and thrilled about it because it's still the best player in baseball coming to the Mets. But I really think that in free agency in particular, Yamamoto is the guy. He fills your exact need. You just showed the ability to you know, help one of these guys translate, and Yamamoto is a better pitcher or at least was a better pitcher in Japan than Sango was. So there's every chance that he could be even better. And further, the thing that just excites you more than anything, this dude's 25 years old. He's 25. So if you sign him to an eight-year deal, you're not even getting his mid-30s, or you're getting the beginning of his mid-30s. You're not getting a pitcher that's going to be in his late 30s at the end of that deal. What did we just see with the Mets signing old pitchers? This is the opposite of that. So to me, I'm all in on this. The question then becomes, you get in the room, you have Sanga's help in getting a deal done. What's that deal look like? And that's what I'll discuss next. How much money would it take to sign Yoshinobu Yamamoto in free agency? We'll discuss that next. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The World Series is set to begin on Friday, and there's still one more game left in the NLCS between the Phillies and the Diamondbacks. If you've yet to make your postseason debut, now is the time with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Join FanDuel today. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to create your new account. Then you can get in on the action from the first pitch until the final out. Today, imagine the odds you could have got on Tommy Pham hitting a home run, but that is exactly what he did in the first inning to open the floodgates for the Diamondbacks. Here's your opportunity to bet on Pham, maybe, to go yard again, to bet on the Diamondbacks to win and pull off the upset. Or if you want to hedge your happiness, you bet on the Phillies. If they win, okay, you win a little money. If they lose, hey, best case scenario, the Phillies are out of the playoffs. Also, if you don't want to wait to watch the whole game to get a W, predict what will happen in the next at bat with quick bets. Head on over to fanduel.com slash locked on right now. Step up to the plate this postseason with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. How much money will Yoshinobu Yamamoto get in free agency? The precedent was set back in 2014 for the highest contract ever given to a Japanese player coming over, and that was Masahiro Tanaka with the Yankees. Got a seven-year, $155 million deal. Like Yamamoto, he was 25 years old at the time. Also similar, he had pitched to a sub-1-5 ERA in his last season in the NPB. He pitched to a 1-2-7 ERA in 212 innings, Tanaka did. Yamamoto this year pitched to a 1.21 ERA and 164 innings pitch. So similar arcs there. Back in 2014, the price tag was $22 million per season over that seven-year deal. 
now about a decade later feels like Yamamoto should be commanding more than that. Uh, you know, at least 25 million per season, potentially more MLB trade rumors floated the number to sign him at a guarantee of at least 200 million. The more I try to search other, you know, articles today, trying to find places that had any rumors about what he's going to make. Everyone has that number at least 200 million, at least 200 million, at least 200 million. What does that contract look like though? That's the interesting thing to me because you can say 200 million and you can just sort of be lazy with it. Say, Hey, 25 million a year, eight year deal, $200 million. But I wanted to look at Kodai Senga's contract because they're represented by the same agency. Now there's no way they're getting them for five years, 75 million, like they got Senga last year. But I just want to look at the language and look at some things that might be included. And I learned some things that I didn't know previously about Senga's contract. So it's a five-year deal that we knew, $15 million per season, structured with $14 million base. It was a $5 million signing bonus, so that gets tacked on you know, each year when it comes to the average annual value to get to that $15 million number. But essentially, a three-year, $45 million deal when you consider the opt-out. But the opt-out is really interesting. What I did not realize is the opt-out is available after 2025 if – he pitches 400 innings from 2023 to 2025. So this past year, he pitched 166 and a third. That knocked that number down to he needs 233 and two third innings pitched over the next two years to trigger his opt out. If he's healthy and effective, probably opts out. If he gets hurt at any point, he's going to end up sticking around for that five year deal. And there was some rumors at the time of the signing that some iffy medicals led to you know some of the language in the contract and the Mets getting him at a relative steal. Not sure if that's going to be the case with Yamamoto, but I do think that it's interesting to note that on Senga's deal and also to just understand that an opt-out is likely to be present in this contract because it would allow Yamamoto to come over. He's going to get paid and going to have a lot of guaranteed money coming his way, but at 25 years old, you're probably going to want to, if you're his camp, have him be able to exercise free agency one more time, potentially before he hits 30. So an opt-out after year four on that deal, to me, that makes a lot of sense. And honestly, on both sides, because an opt-out, it's not really a horrible thing for the team. Yes, you'd love to have the pitcher for the length of the contract if they are really effective. And those opt-outs are player-friendly in the sense that if they're pitching well, they'll trigger. And if they're not pitching great, they're not going to take it. But if there's no opt-out, that's still the case if they're not pitching well. And if there is, it allows you a chance to reevaluate. Yes, you might have to spend more to keep them at that point in time, but you also can go in another direction. And you don't have to necessarily pay the back end of a contract that maybe might not look better when you get down the line. So I don't think that that's a bad thing for the Mets if they have to put an opt-out into it. Now, looking back at Sanga's contract, there's some more interesting notes I found. He does have a 2028 option, uh, which triggers if he has Tommy John surgery or a right elbow injury that keeps him on the IL for 130 plus days. The option price increases $2 million with a Cy Young, $1 million for second to fifth place in the voting. So with what I think he's going to get this year, which is at least a top five finish, that option becomes a $16 million option. But again, it's only made available if he ends up with Tommy John surgery. Um, Also in the contract, there's incentives for Cy Young, $50,000. Second place, $25,000. That could be coming Senga's way. $10,000 for third place. $100,000 for World Series MVP or reliever of the year. $50,000 for Gold Glove All-Star, which he triggered already, or LCS MVP. So with the season he had, potentially being the second place runner up in the Cy Young and already being an all-star $75,000 in bonuses could be going to Senga. You could see similar bonus structure applied to Yamamoto, maybe at higher dollar values to incentivize him to sign. Um, Another thing, full no trade clause that Kodai Senga got 2023 to 2025, 10 team, no trade clause 2026 to 2028. These are things that some teams won't be willing to put into a contract. If the Mets do, it makes their offer more attractive. So I would expect a deal to have a no trade clause in it. I would expect a deal to have an opt out after they'll probably push for after year three. If you're the Mets and you're giving him 
upwards of 200 plus million dollars. You'd push for after year four, year five of that deal. Um, and then all that extra incentive stuff, like I said, it'll be there maybe at a higher rate than what Sanga got. Now, because of his age, I think he's going to get eight years. I really do. At least seven. Tanaka got seven. I would not be surprised if he can push for eight. And in this particular market where, yes, there's some starting pitching, but Blake Snell, Aaron Nola uh, are the other top two pitchers. Jordan Montgomery has certainly pitched himself into that conversation in the postseason. He carried uh, Max Scherzer in this game seven tonight. Those are the, the top guys on the market. I think Yamamoto might be the best pitcher of the bunch when you factor in that age component. So, yeah, I don't think eight years out of the question. I actually had someone today text me uh, through subtext, one of our Locked On Mets insiders, asking me if the Mets should go to a 10-year, $250 million deal. By the way, since I just mentioned it, if you want to join and become a Locked On Mets insider, you can find the link in the episode description so that you can text with me one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You can also get my text message updates to all the Locked On Mets insiders where you might find out that I'm talking about Yamamoto on the next show, and we can go back and forth on it before I actually hit record uh, that night. So if you want to check that out again, ep the link is in the episode description, or you can go to uh, subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. Getting back to the contract, the Locked On Mets insider texted me, you know, 10 years, $250 million. I thought, ah, they're not going to go 10 years, and I still don't think that they will. But the more that you read about him and the market he's about to enjoy, it is not entirely out of the question. I still think it's eight, but you really never know. It could end up being nine, uh, depending on, on the market. And that's where it gets a little bit more concerning. The longer and longer you go on a contract for a pitcher, it's dicey. It really is. Because if all of a sudden he has... Tommy John twice in the first six years of that deal, you might be paying a guy four years, you know, at a hundred million dollars plus at the end of the contract where he's not even pitching. You end up with the Steven Strasburg situation. So it's always dangerous to, to invest in a pitcher. I think because of the age he's worth it. I, I think I would stop at eight years. So then it gets to what is that contract um, going to amount to? I threw out the eight for 200. I think it's more than that due to the market that he's going to have. So I ultimately went back and forth on it. And what I landed on was an eight year, $218 million contract. What does that mean? It means a $26 million base per season and a $10 million signing bonus. That's what I think gets a deal done. 27.25 million per season. It's a lot of money for a pitcher who's yet to throw a pitch in major league baseball. But I think he's going to be worth that money. I want to explain why I believe that to be the case, how he'd fit in this rotation, and also who else will be in the market for him. So we'll get to all of that next before we do. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. The NBA season tips off this week. The NFL season's in full swing. If you're looking to go to any games this winter, Game Time is where you should go for particularly your last minute tickets where you can find killer deals easy to all of the music, sports, comedy, and theater near you. You can stop stressing over how you're going to get the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you're going to have at the game. The game time guarantee means you're always going to find the best price. If you find tickets in the same section or row for less game time will credit you 110% of the difference It's the fastest growing ticket app in the country for a reason. Get images of your seats before you buy. So you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You can see the sight lines. If you're looking down at the court, looking at the football field, whatever it is, you'll be able to know what to expect. You can buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps, you're all set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. You can snag tickets without the stress by using GameTime. If you want to today, download the GameTime app, create an account. Use the code LOCKDOWNMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Great account, redeem the code locked on MLB for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, why is Yoshinobu Yamamoto worth $218 million on an eight year deal before he throws a pitch in the big leagues? Because this dude's really good. Pitched to a 1 2 1 ERA in 164 innings this year. I know I mentioned that, but that bears repeating a 1 2 1 ERA. Granted, Hitting is not as good over in the MPB as it is in the MLB. 
but still a 1 2 1 ERA. Talks to you. 169 strikeouts and 164 innings pitch. He walked just 28. So his strikeout to walk ratio was 6 to 1. I love that in a pitcher, a guy that can attack batters in the zone. His whip was 0.884. He allowed just two home runs all season. Compare that to Kodai Senga in his last year in the MPB. Senga pitched a 194 ERA. Good, not quite as dominant. He pitched 144 innings, less than Yamamoto did by 20. He had 156 strikeouts, which when it comes to strikeouts per innings, better. But overall, Yamamoto had him there. The whip for Senga was 1.056, and he walked 3.1 batters per nine, which was double what Yamamoto walked. His strikeout to walk rate also was half of Yamamoto's. He was 3-1 to one instead of 6-1. to one. He gave up seven home runs. This year, he gave up 17 home runs, facing MLB competition. I can promise you, Yoshinobu Yamamoto is not only going to give up two home runs next year, wherever he pitches. He's going to give up a lot more than that because MLB hitters are better at getting their pitch and hammering it. With that said, he has a four-pitch mix. Very similar to Sanga, fastball, sl- uh, splitter, cutter. Those are the main pitches. Also has a good curveball. Uh, you know, for Sanga, it was more a slider sweeper that he would mix in. But we saw this year when Sanga got to his best, it's when he really just relied on the three-pitch mix of fastball, splitter, cutter. I think Yamamoto can find very similar success to that. So I think the dude's going to translate because – he was better than Senga was in the NPB, and he's younger. So I think his stuff is just as good. It might be a little bit of a learning curve, but he's going to have the perfect guy standing next to him in that rotation to be able to help him ease that transition even further. And I think that's going to mean a lot to him. If he wants to have that ascent quickly, and Kodai Senga is, he's already said he doesn't even want to be the ace. He said, I hope there's other pitchers that knock it down. The dude just wants to win. If he's telling him, look, you're going to be the ace and I'm going to help you get there. I I just think it becomes a perfect fit for Yamamoto. And and you look at the other teams interested. I just don't think anyone offers him that. You have, these are the teams that LB trade rumors has said uh, to have been publicly linked to him. Phillies, Giants, Cardinals, Cubs, Dodgers, Diamondbacks, Rangers, Tigers, Yankees, Red Sox. You can scratch off the Tigers, not a big market. And there's, why is he going to go play there? If he wants to pitch in a big market, he could also scratch off the Cardinals, the Rangers, the Diamondbacks. None of them are big markets. The Giants, are they a big market? I guess technically, but I don't know. And you know, they have done really well with pitching. So, so I can't say, hey, they can't help them. But they don't really have the you know past you know top flight starter coming from Japan to point to, particularly in their own rotation currently, to say, hey, we're going to be able to help you. Maybe they're great in the pitch. I don't know. Maybe they offer the most money. I still don't entirely know if I see it. And they also might be too preoccupied going after Otani, which is another reason why I look at the Dodgers who are on this list and say, are they going to devote enough attention to Yamamoto with Otani out there when they've been sort of stacking the deck to get into the Otani race for years now? That's why I'm not as concerned about the Dodgers. You never know. I mean, they could get in the mix, but they also have a lot of pitching coming up in the minor leagues. Are they going to give an eight-year deal to Yamamoto when they're also paying, you know, f- you know, Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts, and they have a decision to make on Walker Bueller coming up soon? So we'll see. The teams that I really look at: the Cubs, the Yankees, and the Red Sox. I think those are teams that have one had a lot of success uh, with the Japanese market. Look at the Yankees. They were the ones that signed Tanaka and you know Hideki Matsui before that. So they had their experience there. The Red Sox have had plenty of success in the Japanese market. And they have Masataka Yoshida on their team right now. The Cubs have Seiya Suzuki on their team. So they have their own little liaisons if they were to use them to try to get into Yamamoto's ear. But I just don't think their you know, ways in are going to mean as much as Kodai Senga, a guy who was his superior as far as you know, age in that league, who wants to roll out the red carpet for him. I really think that's going to matter a lot. And ultimately, if all things are created equal, the Mets have the large market. They have the ability to help him ascend quickly. And if they give him the best offer, I think the deal gets done. So uh, I think this really comes down to what does David Stearns want? Is he 
going to look at all the data and video available to him and say, this is a guy to build around. If he's that committed to it, I think the Mets get him. I have to note too, because I don't believe I touched on it at all throughout the show, is Billy Epler not being here uh, for the negotiation, not being part of the Mets uh, for this specific free agent pitch. I do think it hurts him. And I think it hurts him a lot because, you know, he was the guy that blew Sango away and got him to sign. It was clear that there was a connection there from when he introduced him and the way he talked about him. I, I really, you know, got the sense that if not for Billy Epler, Kodai Sango would not be a New York Met. With that said, in this instance, I think the Mets can still get this done. Because I also don't think that even though he stepped down, I don't think Billy Upler is, uh, you know, declining calls from the Mets and particularly from David Stearns. So while he has had a lot of success, do I think that David Stearns could still have the ability to call up Billy Upler and ask him for some advice on how to go about the pitch? Yeah, I think that can still happen. And with Sanga being part of, the negotiation of it all, just as far as the pitch, I guess the recruitment of it all more than the negotiation. I really think this is going to get done. Uh, I, I think that the Mets need this guy. He is the ace that they can bank on pairing him and Senga atop the rotation gives them a shot in 2024 and 2025. And then after the next season, they can always go out and venture into the market and get the next guy. But I think if you get Yamamoto, then you can shop in the more B tier of free agents if you're going to go that route, or you can look to the trade market to round out the rest of your rotation. Um, but I think this is the guy that will set the tone for the Mets actually going for it next year. Because um, you don't pay pay guy this much money to just still sit out 2024. So I'm excited to see how all of this ends up unfolding throughout the offseason. Uh, probably do more shows on Yamamoto and more stuff comes to light. If I can get some more information on, uh, you know, what he has to offer when it comes to his arsenal and things like that. So make sure you're following along to hit subscribe on YouTube, follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to join our locked on Mets insiders, find the link in the description. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Also, I wrote the Mets off season outlook for just baseball today. It's going to publish tomorrow morning or as you're listening to this, uh, Tuesday morning, and we'll be doing tomorrow's show off of that outlook where I'll give you sort of a blueprint to the Mets off season uh, this year on tomorrow's show. So uh, make sure you are all set to tune into that one. And hey, game seven aboard now. We'll see what happens. As always, we must say it. Let's go D-backs.